minutes are back okay. in the chat. All right. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, thanks to everybody uh, for joining the DNI call. Um, if you could please take a minute and add yourself to the minutes, and tell us how you're feeling today. Um, Jim, if you want to introduce yourself, that would be great. Sure. First time on the call. Yep, that'd be great. So, hey, Jim St. Ledger, based in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, but I, I see the Elizabeth's Comet buried in snow. If you're buried in snow, I'd love to be there because I'm a big snow guy. <laughs> Grew up in the Northeast in the snow and people say, I'd love to leave it, move to Arizona, but I moved to Phoenix and like to drive north a few hours to be in the snow. Um, been at Intel about 20 years or so. Uh, day job is largely around open source software communities, not from a tech dev perspective, but more from a strategy, um, you know, marketing how it fits into our overall plans and representing Intel in a lot of different communities. Um, lately focused on networking, edge and, and cloud native communities. Um, internally at Intel, I've been involved in a lot of our diversity inclusion work, uh, very specifically around disability inclusion. So I spent a lot of time in those communities. I got three kids of each of them have disabilities ranging from autism spectrum to a daughter who's blind. Um, and then over the years, just have been involved in disability related things. And I found you guys through talking to Angela Brown about uh, things at KubeCon and other events and how myself as a person who spends time in disabled communities sees events trying to do accommodations and she's like well the chaos folks gave us some guidance on that so um came off and talked to nicole who works at intel that i think has been involved with you guys she gave me some insights and then i've had on my list to try to join one of your dni calls and first time it's sort of aligned with my calendar so great to be here just looking to learn a little bit more about what you guys are doing and how i might be able to help super happy to have you here that's great and I will say, Nicole is the co-director of the board at the moment. Okay. So, so <laughs> involved, yes, and she's awesome. So, all right. Um, so today, if you, I, I guess I'll facilitate. That's cool. We can co-facilitate like we always do in this one. Um, so a couple things that I wanted to kind of talk about today is one we have a. Um, we have an outstanding pull request and I'll put it in here that Ruth has been working on. So project burnout. And this was, do you all recall, this was a, a metric. So Jim, the way that we work is as a community, we develop metrics that are captured and I'll put it in the spreadsheet here. So we do all of our kind of metrics building work is based off of this spreadsheet. Okay. And this I'm spreadsheet project okay. burnout isn't a project name burnout, but it's about burning out in projects. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yep. Because <laughs> I could see it, somebody saying that's a great name for a project, project burnout. <laughs> it's a little like chaos, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Um so on this list, you'll see at the bottom, do you see the tabs at the bottom? Yep. I can share my screen too. So the tabs at the bottom just represent the different working groups that we have in the chaos project, DNI being one of them. Okay. Um, with risk being another evolution value in common, all have different meeting times and they develop metrics and you can click on any of those tabs. So for example, risk is concerned a lot with at the moment, like uh, upstream and downstream dependencies. Okay. Right. And so in, in each one of these working groups, we have focus areas. So we have event diversity, you'll see row 21, 28. So different areas where um, insight with respect to DNI can be provided through metrics. Um, any of the green, green labels are um, what we've released as part of the chaos project. And they're also available on the CAS website. So there's a, a process to kind of get them out of the spreadsheet, do the work and get them um, officially published on the CAS website. So this is really our tracking spreadsheet. Um, so one of the metrics that um, is currently under community review. So as part of this process, we as a group work to develop a metric. We have a template that we work off of and we talk about it for weeks, months, sometimes <laughs> years. It was like a long time um, before we're, we're all as a, as a group satisfied with what the metric is um, trying to accomplish and how it's represented. Um, we put these metrics out for community review for a month. 
so we can get uh, feedback from people who aren't necessarily on this call or don't participate in DNI, but would like to provide insight as to, to kind of how they think about the metric. And so um, hopefully this is making sense so far, just the workflow that we kind of do. Um, and so one of the metrics that we have currently under review is one called, yes, project burnout. And so um, there's a, there was a, a comment, so I'll put this in the chat here. I don't know if I did this already in the minutes. I put it, oh, I put it in the minutes, but I'll also put it in the chat. Thank you, Georg, for putting the published metrics in there as well. So this was a, a PR issued against the project burnout metric, and it was a fairly extensive pull request, if you recall. Does anybody remember this? So typically, our during the community review period, um, uh, changes to a metric are sometimes grammar related, or it might be the addition of a sentence just to provide additional clarity. This is a fa fairly large one um, from Lawrence. So I think we've had to spend a little bit of time on kind of reorganizing the pull request so that it didn't change the nature of project burnout as it was released from this uh, working group. Does this make sense? So a lot, a lot had changed and it was, it was, um, we, we, we kind of have to deal with this. And so um, I had gone over then to Lawrence's PR and made some requests against that. See what I'm saying? So there was some, the language needed to be cleaned up. So the question is, is how should we kind of work with this fairly substantial change request to a metric that has been released from the working group while still being attentive to the things that Lawrence brings forward, while st still getting the metric through the review period. Do you see what I'm trying to balance here? Like if it's just grammar, it's pretty easy, right? We just accept the PR and move on. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on kind of what we, how we handle this? or silence. <laughs> well, where is it currently then? It's currently it's currently sitting as a PR. Yeah, but uh, what about the status of the PRs you've made on the PR and all that? They have been merged. Okay. So the the meta PRs. Just wondering, do we have yeah. a discussion log or history of this conversation like what motivated these changes? Um we don't. So it was really just an initial PR that Elizabeth, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just going to uh, speak to that a little bit. I, if I recall that meeting, he was um, a little concerned with the length um, and complexity of the questionnaire. So I, I believe that that was the spirit of a lot of those changes was to kind of tighten it up a little and make it a little easier to digest. And someone please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding or, or me remembering that conversation. Yeah, that was it. It was about the question yeah he and Lawrence was like it's the questions were too much the topic questions were too much so how do how do we want to handle this Georg I always look at you because you're really good with process <laughs> I'm I'm looking through this um right now I, I was looking at the individual um commits it uh -huh. looks like he did clean up quite a bit um it looked a lot messier last time i looked at it i think this is the pr that i issued against his pr so oh. if you trace it if you trace it all the way back into his repo see what i'm saying I was able to make comments in Lawrence's repo and then he merged those and those are reflected here now. 
Let me see. I guess one thing that would help me in reviewing a change this large, because it mm -hmm. is a huge change. And it, it I see a couple of things, like there's some grammar fixes, there's things that are like very nitpicky, then there's like completely new sections that are being added in too. Yeah. Like it'd be helpful if we could break this up into smaller, more concise changes so that we could review them in more piecemeal okay. reviewing. Um, Sounds good. It's just a little overwhelming because like there's some things I might want to look closer at, like around some of the question changes or the new sections. But I mean, th there's the small details like formatting and organization of how things are laid out. Well, that's yep. that's probably a lot easier to review than new content. Okay, no, that's fair. Um, listening to that, I guess my reaction would be then to to not merge this as part of this release. I mean, we can always make changes, I think, to metrics down the road. It's would kind of, and then to your point, Justin, taking this PR and possibly breaking it into more manageable pieces for the next release that would be six months down the road. So would this block the, the entire metric in the release or just these proposed changes? Just these proposed changes. We have released metrics yeah. that we knew weren't perfect and knowing that we'll work on them, we'll fix them. Release early or release often. So my, what yeah, I, my question sense. my question right now is the what I'm trying to figure out is the difference between the two merge requests that we have. One that um, is from master and then one is from his patch. And I think they are altering the same project burnout file, but they are doing different things. Okay. Why don't, um, instead of maybe doing this here on the call, do you wanna to try to solve this here, Georg? Or I mean, I can kind of follow Justin's lead and try to probably just close this without merging, but trying to capture what the changes are into a new PR. Yeah, I what I'm seeing is um, redoing stuff from October. The other pull request is much cleaner. Um, it doesn't have as many formatting changes. And there are two changes, really. One is adding a trace data section, which is easy enough to do. We can create one mer pull, one pull request for that. And then okay. the other one is changing the question format or the data collection stuff. Okay. And so editing the collection strategies. I think if we break that out into smaller pull requests like Justin said, and someone needs to go through, figure out where do these questions end up in the new question? So we can actually see. Okay, so I just jotted down, maybe add the trace data section as a single PR. I put this in the notes and then editing the collection strategies as a second PR. I think that should be multiple PRs because that is changing the entire section. Yeah, that's okay. As that's a series just, of, no problem. Yeah. Oops. Okay. Okay. So then do you want to close without merging this one? Only after we have the new PRs. Gotcha. Oh, good, good call. Okay. Uh, whoops. So close, close original PR after new PRs are issued. Yep. Okay. okay, cool. Thank you. I think that's out of out of band kind of stuff. We can talk about that next week if we can make some progress on it. Oh, and then the, the intention is to not necessarily rush this for the release coming up in whatever, soon, March. If we have it by next week, great. Then it can okay. be the release. Otherwise, we don't need to. Okay, sounds good.
everybody okay with this approach? Right on. All right, cool. Um, Matt, I wanted to give you a Matt Snell, I guess. Sometimes, we, uh, yeah. Oh, hi, Armstrong. Um, give you an opportunity to Hello, kind Mike. of give an update on the DNI badging and what you're doing with outreach and how we're actually doing real well in the review process. Yeah, badging is, um, it's, it's nice. I've, um, it's kind of become the highlight of my day because we're doing pretty well these days. Um, and we have, um, let's see, we've got a lot going on with applications lately. So mostly actually from the same person, we've gotten a few applications uh, on behalf of some events at the Linux Foundation. Um, we have uh, a lot of, we had the outreach meeting on Tuesdays and the weekly meeting on Wednesdays. Let me know if anybody ever wants to come to that extra. Uh, and we are really excited that um, we've got so much interest from the community. We've got a lot of people that are talking about putting in 2022 events or late 2021 events um, that they're still working with the committee on getting the, um, the, the information that they need to apply, which there is a little bit of a barrier there that they, um, they have to have some things ready for the application. But we're, we're just uh, excited that we have so much interest from the community. Um, and let's see, um, I just saw um, Anita um, talk about uh, some stuff at FOSS backstage that made me really happy. And I think it was, there was a little mention of the badging program there too. But I, we're also talking about, when it comes to events, we're talking about adding um, some speaker positions when it comes to um, getting on some rosters and talking about the badging project now that we've got a little bit of a following. Okay. That's my update. So, cool. So um, I'll give a kind of an overview a little bit for Jim too. So it, with respect to uh, DNI metrics, one of the challenges that we were having in the chaos project was, so we would develop these metrics that were um, meaningful with respect to DNI, but putting them into practice was pretty challenging because not a lot of them can be automated. <laughs> you know, they require, Kind of thoughtful reflection by a community of people um, to, to do the work around DNI. So the one of the things that we that we have put into practice is this DNI event badging program. So if I take a look at um, I'll share my screen again here. So at the top here we have a series of of metrics that have been released with respect to event diversity, right? And so we asked ourselves, how do we connect with events to um, get them to reflect on speaker demographics, to get them to think about attendee demographics, to make diversity access tickets part of how they run their events? Like, how do we how do we do this? And so the badging program is a way for events to apply uh, for a badge as signaling their attention to these particular issues. And so an event will apply via this form in person or virtual event. This triggers a, it's an issue, right, Matt? In, in our repository, two reviewers are assigned to, to kind of evaluate the information that has been provided by the event. The review is done in an open and transparent way uh, between the applicants and the reviewers discussing things around say speaker demographics or attendee demographics and a badge is awarded based on uh, attending to a particular percentage of the metrics and so we i don't know when did this start matt maybe uh, the end of last, last year september of last year but we started working on it at the beginning of summer okay and so recently we've been kind of at the end of 2020 and at the beginning of 2021 we've started to get a pretty steady number of people applying for the badges, which has been, which has been great because, you know, I think we have a number of reviewers. Is Ruth still on here? So um, is Ruth still here? So uh, no. Ruth, Ruth there's a reviewer. So we've had another really great people kind of go through this process and, you know, FOSS Backstage was, as Matt mentioned, one of the the uh, one of the events that earned a, I think it was our first chaos gold badge, wasn't it? 
Mm-hmm. And uh, cool. Anita's actually a reviewer too. Nice. So we nice work a lot on putting this in. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm just, I'm just curious. So this is, you know, you, you guys come up with these guidelines, uh, events apply for the badge, you know, as they're setting up the event. Do you do any sort of closed loop feedback to say, hey, after the event, um, do they submit, you know, I, I've seen like KubeCon has a, um, I forget what they call it, but it's essentially like an attendee report or something that, that breaks down, hey, the number of speakers and diversity across speakers and attendees and things like that. Is there a sort of a tail end after the effect or is it more front end? Um, it, at the, the moment, it's, it's more front end. Yeah. So we asked them. So like with respect to what you're talking about, we just ask during this badging process, you know, what are their mechanisms by which they would return this information to the Got community? It. Yep. And if they have a, a clear path forward, that usually satisfies it for us. Okay. And we actually have a similar release cycle to at the badging project. We have a similar release cycle to chaos, but it happens a month afterward. Um, so it's March to the end of March. And um, we're actually going to be removing any of the any of the um, requirements that have uh, replacing any of the requirements that actually require the project to put something on their website or do something extra, uh, just for that badge. We, we have things like code of conduct is required, and you they require certain things in the code of conduct. Same with things like diversity access right. tickets, if that's applicable. But um, specifically things like asking them to display their demographics. Um, we've kind of decided that that's not in our domain. It's more that we want to make sure that people are, are event or, organizers are measuring these things in their project and they have some way to show that. Um, but we don't necessarily require that to be displayed as much, uh, definitely at the beginning of the next okay. release as well. Great, thanks. All right, well, that's cool, Matt. And you know, one of the things that I, I I've only mentioned like uh, many times is that one of my concerns is that as many events start applying for the badges, the number of reviewers that are required, because it is such a, a human interaction uh, needs to go up as well. And so I think you have been chatting with Elizabeth for outreach stuff. Yeah, we already got someone reaching out to or, uh, someone that I reached out to is coming back as a reviewer today. So that's cool. Oh, perfect. Great. Um, and if we we'll need, need to have, that. yeah, and if we need to have uh, training sessions or the onboarding sessions, we can find time to get that done. You know, if there's half a dozen folks that would like to join as reviewers, I think it would be important to go through that process as well. Definitely. Yeah, I posted this on Twitter and also in um, Justin's OSDI initiative, and I actually just got an email from someone responding. So I'm um, going to probably connect you, Matt, with this person, so. Yeah, awesome. Cool. I'm, I really like this project, <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's really great. It's just great to see these things in practice. So, um, all right, cool. Um, anything else on for Matt or Elizabeth on DNI badging? All right. Um, Matt, I just want to share that I got one paper accepted for XC that really works on the ecosystem onboarding process. So we work, we showed a lot of significant results, how mentoring helps productivity, diversity. We measure gender diversity, technical diversity, and corporate diversity in the paper. And we show a lot of other interesting metrics with, with some of the chaos metrics that we captured and some other ones that we use uh, elsewhere to measure uh, things like good qualities and the uh, effort. I think I will share that link might be, it can be of interest for some works that we are doing. Yeah. I mean, you... so, uh, one paper that Nicole and uh, I think it's, um, I've forgotten the other guy who wrote that paper on gender diversity on uh, Daniel Oakland. Esquerdo. Sorry, Georg. Daniel Esquerdo. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Daniel. Yeah. So we bear on that on that paper. Our paper was accepted for XC twenty one. It's very interesting. Congratulations, XC is a nice venue. Yeah. Yeah, and if you could put that, I think Justin was asking for it, and Matt was asking for it, yes, I will, <laughs> and I, will, I would like I to see it too. I will share yeah. It also right now. Yeah. That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, and Owen Gear too. So, 
Um, Justin, you had unmuted for a second. Did you have a comment as well? Oh, I was I was just saying great work to Matt Snell and the team on the badges. Right on. All right. Um, cool. So I, I think the the last little bit here is is if we could find <laughs> if we could um, I'm going to share my screen. So as part of our work, uh, right, we are in the um, we're, we're aimed at developing metrics. And I think right now with the last release, we had a, a really great push on, on putting forward some, some chaos metrics. Um, I laughed because I saw, I don't know who put that in there, but <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I was alluding to earlier that some metrics take like a couple of weeks and some a couple of months and some a couple of years, but this documentation metric is, it's in the totally latter category, so. It's been tricky. Um, you know, really a lot of what we do is, is just trying to find metrics that, that we feel can help kind of build out our, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like build, improve transparency on areas where we maybe don't have a lot of transparency with respect to DNI. Um, and also metrics that are of personal interest to people. That always seems to to be kind of important. Um, so here's the question. <laughs> Looking at the spreadsheet, we, so we just had a great push in project and community. Is there anything for people that is of particular interest? So we have clear and uh, I'm sorry, clean and clear code. Is that in here somewhere? I don't see it. I thought that would be a great communication metric. Like, even if it's just like plain language. So is that, did, is this with, is this an issue that we have? I see Georg and Alexander and Emma on this. Georg, do you have a comment on this one? No, I don't. It was this, you, you're on there. <laughs> I suppose I could, <laughs> it's okay. All right. Um, communication inclusivity, alternative. Don't know what this is. Look at that, Georg, it's you again. <laughs> That's this. <laughs> I haven't looked at these in forever, like two years, almost three years. I think these were probably me. You know how I've been going through issues and PRs trying to clean these up? So this is probably me trying to draw some of these forward. Um, diversity and delivery of talk material. This is... Um, probably hey that's me so probably more uh, straightforward and then Matt you had mentioned something as well no, I was just talking about the clean and clear code being like uh, talking about ease like ease of communication or like um, we just saw a presentation about uh, from Anita about um, it's part of what she was talking about was being able to understand and like read, not only read, but like comprehend the documentation as a new contributor. That would be the, just the communication or the documentation in the project itself. I guess it's not only just documentation, but it's like the language in the documentation. And it's like uh, the plain language specifically is what I was thinking about when I saw that. That's just what I was mentioning. And I'm not sure if that falls into the documentation. I guess it really doesn't. Gotcha. Um, I'm going to put Jim on the spot too for your work at Intel. <laughs> you know, are there, if you, from a really broad perspective, looking at how we've been 
categorizing and thinking about metrics, are there any in the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis that are important to the to you and important to the people that you work with? Yeah, I'm kind of scrolling through your spreadsheet. Um, so, so I guess there, there's a couple things from my perspective, right? The, diversity is probably the single biggest one from a standpoint of we're going to get more diverse people involved. You know, I mentioned one of the areas I do work in is a networking space and networking is one of these, I don't know, kind of obscure niche areas of development that tends to be difficult to enter into. And as, you, as I think about conferences that I've gone to and ones that, you know, networking communities I mean, have hosted, you look around the room and it's 90 plus percent, you know, men, um, you know, like a lot of our communities, not necessarily all white, um, we get a fair number of, you know, uh, folks originally from India are currently there in China as well, but um, predominantly men. So how do we change that? And then when I look internally, uh, what I see in our teams is much more diversity. But for some reason, we can't get these women to step up and get engaged. So pushing on that is definitely a big thing internally and externally. Um, you know, Intel has sponsored lunches at things like Open Networking Summit and KubeCon for several years now, working with ELF and CNCF folks. So that's certainly a priority for us. Um, mentoring and sort of sponsorship of interns and, um, you know, new people to communities is an element. Um, you know, there, there's uh, work we did last year. We actually had some extra money given how 2020 rolled out differently than we may have expected to where we uh, put a bunch of money into the LF to help go and drive a uh, mentoring, virtual mentoring program with them, not just us, but some seed money to get it going. So that's a big thing. The, the challenge is interesting because there's, there's coming up on another round of that. You know, there's Google Summer Code, then there's like LF mentoring programs, and then there's other bucket of things we do ourselves. And not unlike many things, when I ping the folks saying, hey, we'd love to see us do more in this one project around mentoring, you know, other people, the answer I got back was, yeah, we'd love to too, but we just sort of rolled out our own intern and local university mentoring program, and that's consumed all the bandwidth of our folks. So, you know, th those are just choices and priorities that folks make. Uh, the reality of you can't do everything. So choose where and when you want to do something. Um, those are kind of, I don't know if that's helpful. That's sort of top of mind of the, the things outside of working on code that we're driving into communities. It is, it, I think that's helpful. There were a couple that, uh, first of all, do other people have comments on this? I don't always need to talk. Elizabeth? Amy, you just joined comments. Hello, Amy. Hello, I didn't realize I wasn't on me. Okay, I'm in the truck, so if you hear weird things. So what were we talking about mentoring? Um, so we're just talking about, right now we're talking about what is our next kind of set of metrics that we want to think about in the working group. And um, Jim has joined us and Jim is from Intel. And he was kind of talking about things that, that are important to him or things that he is, is seeing as important in the DNI space. And mentoring had come up, mentoring and sponsorship. And so. Uh, mentoring is hard. Um, when we did one-on-one -on -one mentoring with OpenStack, sometimes we had people who would reply and were very active. And then other times, you know, they wouldn't talk to each other. So we switched to cohort mentoring thinking two to three mentors for a group of mentees that could come in and out as they met the goal of that mentoring cohort. And that really didn't take off as well either. But so we've tried a couple of different things with OpenStack and still haven't hit the magic thing. And a lot of it's time. A lot of it's the mentees don't necessarily follow up with the mentors enough, I think, um, because they should be the ones driving it for a good mentorship. But I kind of like the thought on sponsorship. You know, if somebody was paired with somebody coming into a project and they were the sponsor and just a point of contact for, hey, could you give this a review before I show it to everyone else or something like that? I think that's a very interesting concept. Um, I don't know of anyone doing that. So I don't know if we can get metrics on that. Um, what else would be a good mentor? for us. Did we ever finish burnout? 
Uh, we did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> but yes, we did. So I was okay. looking at, uh, I was looking at, I'll share my screen again. Um, we do have a sponsorship metric and a mentorship metric that have been released and they're under leadership. So and I think sponsorship in this case is about uh, companies giving money. <laughs> writing a mentor provides guidance. Let's see. Effective leadership tax for increasing diversity. Is this Jim, can you see this? Does this read differently than what is on your mind? Give me a second. Okay, and it would really be this paragraph here. Yes, so so for you know the, the only sponsor in that I'm aware that we do is internally, and through okay. a lot of our diversity and inclusion work, you know there, there, there's different. We have employee resource groups across a certain vector, whether it's you know blacks or women or um, indigenous people, what what have you, pick a category, and then we have leadership councils, which tend to be senior people that tend to do two things. The first thing they do is mentoring people. And usually the second thing on a more focused basis is sponsoring. Um, I personally don't see those separated though, because I don't think you can just randomly say, hey, I'm gonna sponsor somebody because how do you build that relationship and rapport with them to where you know them and you understand them, their objectives, their strengths, their weaknesses, et cetera. They know you. So this relationship is built on trust and a certain level of intimacy from a career objectives perspective. So then you can go out and sponsor them and help advance them forward. Um, I, I, maybe it's possible to not do both, but you know that's how we do it. And I personally think that works well because you need that relationship of trust to be able to sponsor somebody and then look for opportunities for them. When you take it externally, I, I, I just my initial sense is it becomes really difficult. Um, you know, to Amy's comment on just trying to do mentoring, if you can't make that work, I don't know how you you skip through all that and get to the point of where you can be sponsoring people if you can't be mentoring them as a foundational part of it. I, I will say, and if you're interested, um, one of the, I do a lot of work in LF Edge and there's like nine sub projects and there's one called Open Horizon that a lot of IBM folks are involved in. And those folks have been my role model for driving a, a mentoring program, you know, through Linux Foundation, I think it's part of LFX, the old community bridge stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, in that, and they did a report out in one of our um, technical advisory council meetings on their success on it, both from the standpoint of, you know, they posted opportunities on projects for interns to be mentored in these projects. They got a bunch of applications and they went through like a three tier screen and they said, you know, half of it worked itself. The, the first half was a bunch of people that were shotgunning out, you know, applications for anything that moved. And then they said, great, now we'd like to have this next level of information and half the people never responded, meaning they really weren't that interested. And then when they got to the third level, which was great, we now want this level of information, we're gonna set up time with you. Half the people again dropped out, sort of self-selected. And then when they finally got to, hey, we've got three, four people who volunteered to mentor and we have maybe five people who put in for it, it, it worked down pretty easy to get a match. And the people they have were definitely pretty diverse. I, I specifically recall one woman who's a, I think she's like a last year CS student in India. And she talked about having no idea how to get involved in open source community. She had no exposure to it. And this project gave her that entry point. And she just, her change in how she came into it and how she came out of it seemed that it had a tremendous impact on her personally. And my suspicion is how her career will progress. Now, mm -hmm. whether or not her mentor will then turn into a sponsor and a long-term mentoring relationship, I don't know. I think that's probably as much to do with her and what she wants to follow up with as anything else. But um, that process from what I've seen was probably one of the best ones to date. Nice. Um, if you want, so I, can, I, have... I can dig out some meetings and a link to that from our other project because those calls are all recorded and posted as well. It'd always be nice to share. I don't mind seeing that right. stuff. Um, so I'm wondering if looking at our list, this one hasn't come up yet, but do you see row 45, which is onboarding? I was actually, I was just thinking we've had a lot of the conversation. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see been... your hand. 
Oh, yeah, no, no. Um, but I was just thinking with the theme Armstrong was talking about, the, the paper that he submitted around that had a mentorship component. Jim has been mentioned some of the mentorship component here. And I was looking through the metric that we've published around mentorship and sponsorship. And these do a good job of defining, assuming you have a successful mentorship program in place, but we don't have anything around, well, how do you know what a good mentorship program looks like? And this is something I've been thinking about a lot in my day in my day job site as well. So I was actually going to propose that maybe this onboarding metric would be a really helpful one to try to better unpack what goes into successful. Because I see onboarding and mentorship, while not one to one, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, I would be really interested to explore this a little deeper and maybe push forward on this one. So the fact that you mentioned that and i think the fact that i had highlighted it is means that there's two votes which i'm guessing is gonna <laughs> take the day <laughs> does so anybody what are we looking at on onboarding i mean because i think OpenStack has really good onboarding our documentation our you know we hold events just for onboarding and so on but yet we can't get a good mentoring group going so to me they're not the same thing but what was your relationship that you thought they were the same thing? Personally, I don't, I don't think they're the same thing, but I think they're related. Okay. Justin, go ahead. Yeah, one example I was just thinking about is around like mentorship. Like in my experience in the Fedora project, we have a mentorship special interest group and their role is specifically to help funnel new contributors into different places in the project. So instead of the entry point of, like find the place you want to contribute and then look there for help. We would take the idea of talk to a person first who can help guide you and help you navigate through this wider community. And there's a group of folks who are who are interested and want to do that kind of work. Um, so that's that was kind of my part one piece of like my motivation is exploring what are these different kinds of mentorship models that are also part of onboarding because I, I see mentorship as part of onboarding because it's also about how you bring new people into the community and build a sustainable community where there's not people burning out uh, related to the burnout metric, you know. Um, I guess that's some of my experience with it and where I was coming from. Okay, I'll take a look at the Fedora stuff because we have a first contact SIG in OpenStack and yet we're still having issues if it's working for Fedora. It might be worth looking to see what they're doing differently. I'll drop so, a link in the chat here with more info. Can you put it in the minutes too, Justin? Thank you. Because we're about ready to close up this Zoom call and the chat will <laughs> go away. Um, all right, so I, I think maybe onboarding would be a, a nice place to, to start taking a look next week from a development perspective. Um, is everybody all right with that? because we're approaching the end of our time. So we'll kind of lead with that next week and, and what, what it means. Amy, were you, did you have something, Amy? Or were you just saying good? I was saying good because it sounded like you wanted us to say something. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, this is great. This is a, a nice productive meeting. Jim, we're really happy that you were able to join us and we hope that you can continue to come. That's for well, sure. Do the best. Do the best I can. Um, okay. I, I put one link in the minutes to this Linux Foundation networking um, mentorship program. I'm still I still have to sort through meeting minutes from our other TAC meetings and figure out what the right date was. But when I get it, I'll paste it into the meeting minutes as well, so you can take a look at that. Certainly appreciate it. Sure. All right, everybody. We'll have a have a wonderful day. Stay warm if you're in this cold snap somewhere in the country, <laughs> or the snow 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 zone somewhere in the country too. If you're in go. Phoenix, we have no, we're happy for you. <laughs> we're all happy for you. Let me know if you need some sunshine, I'll send it your way. So. Please. Oh, all right. it's coming next week. It's coming next week. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good to meet you all. Bye. Bye.